It is Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Café Web Talk time. Our Space Café Web Talk, 33 minutes with Catherine Courtney, will begin soon. Thank you for joining us for our talk today about space for future generations. Are we sleepwalking into the next catastrophe? As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. And that is a very valuable our feedback for us and it will help us to improve to make our shows better and more informative for you. I'm Torsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of Spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. The latest episode featured Bruce Damer about new series about the origin of life. And that's just a mind-blowing podcast episode. So listen to it if you can. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. Yeah. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends, and the ones you love, and your support is needed to keep our work alive. And we do that for you. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. My guest today is somebody I met a year ago in one of the Space Cafes here because she raised very interesting questions. So I contacted her and we had an absolute, and I, I was absolutely impressed by her views and background. So I'm absolutely grateful to have her in my show today. Welcome. Catherine Courtney. She says about herself, I help organizations create clear strategies, manage risk and multiple returns on innovation investment. Bring governments, researchers and businesses together to apply innovation to key policy aims and support startups to scale up. With non-executive and executive experience spanning international regulated industry, central government and tech startup, I bring board level experience in working with government and regulators, tech enabled transformation and foreign strategic partnerships. So many hard words in one sentence. <laughs> Her last public uh, sector role was as chief executive, chief executive of the UK Space Agency, where she opened the UK market to satellite launch, space flight and spaceport operators established UK leadership of the European Space Agency's telecoms, navigation and Earth observation programs, and inspired a future generation of scientists and engineers through major Tim Peake's successful, highly successful um, um, Principa mission. She is also the founder of Primary Space, a charity that leveraged the wonders of space science and technology to engage primary school teachers and children with STEM careers. And I'm very happy to learn about it later. Knowing we just picked a few highlights of your impressive career, I would leave it for it at the moment and just go into our dialogue. Catherine, thank you very much for being with us today. So jumping straight into our topic about our own responsibility as humanity, what is the most important issue we should be aware when it comes to, uh, should be aware of when it comes to space. Over to you. Hi, Torsten, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan. I learned so much um, from your space cafes. Um, I think the first thing to answer your question before I answer it, I should tell the attendees that I am not a subject matter expert. I am um, really just a concerned citizen and mother of three. Uh, but I do have firsthand experience as the former regulator for UK licensed space operations. Um, and so, as you know, what I believe the biggest issue facing uh, space today is sustainability. Um, space is changing, it's changing very quickly. Uh, it's becoming more contested and congested. Uh, the US, the UK, NATO and other countries have declared space a warfighting domain. But at the same time, 
we have this land grab going on between um, entrepreneurs who are looking to try and um, put as many satellites into orbit as they can with mega constellations, um, really in order to secure orbital slots and spectrum uh, you know, advantages. Today we have about um, 6,000 satellites in orbit. About half of those are junk. There are tens of thousands of planned launches of satellites over the next coming years. And it's not just satellites that are the problem in space at the moment. There's uh, ESA estimates, the European Space Agency estimates there are about 170 million pieces of debris up there. Um, and, you know, even a tiny speck of paint, if it's traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, um, you know, it can, it can have more of an impact strength uh, than, you know, 10 times faster than the fastest bullet uh, we know here on, on land. Um, I, recently, I read that Roscosmos has, you know, said that they, uh, they observe 4,500 dangerous close approaches every year uh, and interestingly commented that uh, they don't always move their spacecraft to get out of the way, partly because they can't uh, and other times because they choose not to, um, because they don't want to waste the fuel or they don't want to interrupt their missions. Um, so, you know, my sense is the biggest issue facing us today is that space is changing so fast and yet here we are managing these disruptive 21st century new activities with tools and techniques that were developed in the 1960s and international agreements from the 1980s. It's just not fit for purpose. That doesn't sound so too good. So as we are talking on the other side about a billion dollar industry in the years to come, or at least that's predicted by all these wise people. Um, how can we fix this issue? Or at least how can we start to unlock a process to fix this issue? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to go so, so far to say, hey, where's the solution? So please let us know. Uh, but how can we start it? Well, it's a, you know, it is a challenging and complex problem because um, there are so many uh, parties involved because it is an you know space with by definition uh, is a domain without borders uh, and so national authorities you know just sort of do their own thing um, in space and the UN tries very hard through UNOSA and other committees uh, to push forward international agreements um, but it is very difficult uh, and I think you know, the key that could unlock progress uh, really lies in the data. Um, we have, you know, throughout the many decades relied largely on the US Department of Defense and this, you know, free monitoring service that they provide to the rest of the world, whether they're commercial operators or, you know, civil space authorities or, or researchers. Uh, and, you know, the challenge with that is that, that that isn't really what that system was designed for. And it sort of made sense when the U.S. owned most of the assets in space, but that is for sure no longer the case. And um, even those catalogs that object monitoring that they do, you know, uses very uh, antiquated um, tools and techniques, you know, the algorithms, I, you know, I am, as I say, no subject matter expert, but I, you know, believe subject matter experts like Dr. Marie Baja from the University of Austin, Texas, you know, when he mentions things like um, those models assume that all the objects up there are spherical. Well, Sputnik, the first satellite was a sphere but pretty much nothing else has, has been spherical <laughs> since then, you know, very few of them are spherical, most of them, you know, are all sorts of shapes. And if you're looking, for instance, at a, a defunct, you know, rocket bee from a launch, and that object looks like this, but you're looking at it from this point of view, you know, you're not going to get an accurate measurement on what that object is doing up there. And then there are issues about transparency. Uh, that data is collected, you know, largely for defense purposes and so shared on a need to know basis. Um, and then, you know, it means there's duplication of effort. Everybody has to 
uh, monitor their own spacecraft. Their data collection techniques and analysis techniques will be different from everybody else's. And so there is actually no single verifiable version of the truth of what's going on. And my strong view is that, you know, what the world needs is to create a sort of trusted, transparent, digital twin of the man-made night sky, of the man-made space environment, uh, so that, you know, we have this real-time, updated, trusted, verifiable set of data. And that would be the key to unlocking both solutions to the problem, you know, uh, debris collection and debris removal proposals. They, they can't really operate unless they can see what they're going up there to try and collect and what else might be in their path. Um, and you can't actually legislate and come up with international treaties that are enforceable unless you can monitor and verify and inspect what's going on. So, you know, I learned over nearly 15 years in the center of government doing, you know, large pieces of legislation. Don't, don't try and pass laws that you can't enforce. And we're in a position where you know, we're trying to negotiate uh, voluntary norms of behavior and the UK has, you know, shown some great leadership uh, proposing those in the UN has also, um, you know, developed guidelines for safe and responsible operations in space, but they're all voluntary because actually you can't have rules of the road unless you can monitor what's actually going on. So I think the main, 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 key to the solution to start finding solutions is to fix the data problem. I just want to repeat what you just said, because I think that's that's so important, especially for our friends in the in the audience. Uh, so Jessica, please uh, listen to that. Uh, I mean, we have our uh, Jessica West in the in, in the room and others that are very deep engaged in these norms and behaviors. But what is it all worth? as you said, if it's if it can't be enforced. So, uh, I mean, how did we learn as kids good behavior? Yeah. By talking about that? Not in our age, I would say. So. <laughs> yeah, we've um, done a lot of talking. There's a yeah. lot of talking going on. And it's, it is heartening to see how this issue is going up the agenda, up the policy agenda for governments around the world. Um, and for commercial operators as well. However, you know, I think there needs to be this step change in capability for space traffic management yeah. before solutions, you know, can be can be put in place. But based on your experience, um, so how far are we away from a transparent, open, trusted uh, data source for all? I mean. There are attempts, and you mentioned uh, Moriva, who is a big, uh, a great friend of us, and we give him every room we can to to uh, ex or ex ex or talk about his ideas and and Astria graph. But I mean, sometimes it sounds that he is even he is just in this niche. We have the activities in or in, uh, in 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 Scotland, so with think tank mass, uh, which in, in their initiatives and so on. So we have this patchwork of activities worldwide. So, but none of them are working together, not talking about all the militaries and people that don't want to tell where their stuff is. So. I, I agree, you know, what, there is a need for more collaboration. Um, I mean, what, uh, what Dr. Jaw does is, you know, try to bring transparency, um, but, you know, get with limited sources of data. Um, I have a fairly simplistic view that if if uh, the different operators in space, if commercial operators who today are effectively uh, duplicating the efforts of governments by you know creating their own space surveillance and tracking, building the, in their own you know situational awareness capabilities, um, if they could you know just see the the resources that they are deploying on that. Um, I, I think there was a, um, a OECD report, you know, that was saying that something like 10 to 15%, I think the, the figure was, of the cost of a space mission 
mm. is all down to, you know, the delays, the delays in finding launch slots and delays in uh, licensing approvals, the delays, you know, and then having to, you know, maneuver your way through, pick your way through that junkyard to get to your designated orbital slot that, you know, there's a, there's a real economic and financial cost to that. Mm. So I think if governments and the, the defense community and commercial operators could, you know, this is me coming from, you know, a kind of industrial background, just pull your, uh, pull your requirements, your operational requirements specification together to say, where are those shared requirements that all of the stakeholders up in space have in order to keep their interests safe and sustainable? If those could be pulled together and articulated, I think that there's more than enough expertise around the world in data analytics, in observational sciences, in astrodynamics, you know, I think there was more than enough expertise in the space community to solve that problem. But I do think that it, it just requires a kind of collaborative effort, a coalition of the, the willing and the interested to come together. I do think there's a, a real role Personally, I would say this as the former, uh, you know, senior civil servant from the UK, but I think there's a real role for the UK to play in uh, with its allies in forging that, you know, coalition of the willing and the interested to do tangible, practical work that could create progress and momentum. We hear you. So, <laughs> and we, we take, take your words and, and I'll give them some room. Let's talk some an, another slowly realized or by us crisis, and that's the, cr the climate crisis. So, what can we learn from that from that crisis that is obviously there? And not saying what can we learn from the mistake we made already in just sleeping yeah. over it. I mean, I think there's there's a it's not just analogies. We're just repeating history here. <laughs> so I think, you know, it took us centuries since the Industrial Revolution to recognize, um, you know, the consequences and of our behaviors and our actions, and the damage that we're doing to this planet. And we have only been, um, you know, going to space since uh, 1957. So we haven't had quite as long to mess things up up there. And people have the, the perception that space is big. It's a big place and so things are spread out. And it is true, space is big, but it is also cluttered. It is becoming increasingly cluttered. Um, and it's a unique and fragile environment. And I think you know what lots of people don't recognize is um, unlike on the earth, what, we, what we've seen during the pandemic is we've seen um, earth observation imagery that shows how quickly nature repairs itself on the earth if we just get out of the way for about a year, you know? <laughs> and that's you know, really interesting to see. And I think uh, with the interest from the G20, with the COP26, um, which is happening this year in the UK and Glasgow, you know, with the Biden administration and, you know, dare I say, even now the Boris Johnson administration in the UK, you know, all over, uh, people are waking up and saying, actually, we can take action, we have to take action, we must make commitments and we can um, work towards improving the situation on Earth. My view is that we are just unaware, you know, we don't have a David Attenborough showing us the plastic mountains that, you know, are piling up mm -hmm. in space. Of course, there very little of it is plastic, but it's the same problem. We are cluttering space up with man-made junk, but it's not visible to most of us. And so, you know, in the absence of a David Attenborough, I think what we need to do is do everything we can to raise awareness because it's not too late for us to fix the problem in space. Actually, you know, we're, we're, we're a century and a half ahead of the game, really, because we, we haven't been up there, you know, so long. And we can, I believe, solve those problems. I think one of the keys is um, really to raise public awareness of how dependent we are on space yeah. in our everyday lives. You know, I think most people don't recognize, and there's a very close link to the, the Earth's 
uh, you know, climate. So, you know, half of the essential climate variables that the UN monitors to take the pulse of how healthy our planet is can only be measured from space. And if those satellites go down because they get hit by, you know, a little piece of space junk, or if the data that they, you know, send back has to be um, interrupted because they have to go on a big maneuver. I mean, recently, uh, one of the Galileo spacecraft, ESA, in the last few weeks, you know, had to take their position, navigation, and timing uh, spacecraft out of commission for two weeks so that, that they could move it out of the way of a piece of debris. And, you know, the problem with that is that we are utterly reliant on those systems for the synchronization of computer systems all over the world, you know, for ensuring that the electricity grid works properly and ATM machines work properly and that a trade on the stock market, you know, we know whether it happened a second before or a second after the market closed. And you read every day now about these initiatives to have smart grids and smart cities, and we're all going to have everything managed from our smartphone for our whole life. I even saw recently about uh, digital currencies from central banks. There's, that's a, you know, emerging initiative. The reliance on those, in, the, the internet and all of those infrastructures that we have on space assets to keep them operating effectively and securely mm -hmm. is immense. And I think people just, they, they have no awareness of that. Why should they? But we are sleepwalking potentially, you know, into a, what I call a space climate catastrophe, you know, which would mean a Kessler syndrome scenario. Um, and, you know, for those who aren't aware of it, the, the, you know, the difference on Earth is you can go out and find a solution to the big pile of plastic in the ocean. You can do that. Not sure who it belongs to, takes a lot of international collaboration and coordination, but you can solve that problem and Earth will repair itself. If we have a major collision in space, it is possible to set off a chain reaction, which will make space unusable for generations. And I genuinely feel that we owe it to future generations to take action now to preserve that environment mm. for their benefit, as well as our own. Absolutely. So before we um, lead over to our the, the second part of our discussion about the next generation, I would like to pick up of, on one of the questions that came in uh, while you were talking. Uh, as you mentioned, the G20 um, already. So Thibault asked this year, the G20 will dedicate a specific track to the planet and sustainability. How could we speak about sustainable space activities at the G20? Any answer for that? Yeah, my only answer is that um, we need to persuade the G20 secretariat that there should be, that that should be on the agenda. Um, not just because of the interdependency between sustainability on this planet and sustainability of the tools that we use in space to, you know, monitor and support that, but also because of this issue. If, if, we, if we don't watch out, if we pollute the space environment, you know, in this irresponsible way, uh, we could end up turning the clock back to the 1950s about how we live here on Earth. You know, we wouldn't have uh, satellite television, we wouldn't have sat nav, we wouldn't have, you know, any of those modern conveniences that are utterly dependent on satellites in order to um, operate. Okay, so I wish I had an inside track with the G20 secretariat, but I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> Let's reach out to them directly. So, I mean, sometimes the, the easy solution is the, is the best one. And when we do our podcast invitation to podcasts or so, we just reach out to people. And it's surprisingly how well people respond and, and you, you have a chance to talk with them. Of course, you have to prepare for that, but or I think most of us are in an adequate way. Um, but I mean, the, the second part of, of the discussion and, and our, our announcement was that we want to show ways how we can engage with the next generation. Because, I mean, 
as we are messing up the planet and the surrounding environment. So we can say, yeah, it's over. So, but uh, no, most of us have kids and we have a responsibility for them. So how can we engage them? Uh, now, we, how can we engage them better? And as I mentioned earlier, your organization. So maybe you can enlighten us what your organization, your charity is doing on that matter. Sure. I mean, I, you know, what I know is actually um, children today, the, the young generation, they care deeply about environmental issues. And I think if they, uh, if they were made aware that this is an aspect of the environmental issues, you know, that, it, that our near earth environment is just as important as our terrestrial environment, um, that they would become really powerful advocates. But they also will be the uh, future skilled workers that the space sector needs to develop solutions to create more sustainable technologies for space. And what Primary Space, my charity, um, does is it reaches out to try and engage primary age children and primary school teachers uh, with careers related learning for STEM, to, you know, to inspire and engage children with STEM. Um, the reason that my focus is on primary school children is not just because I have three in that age group, but more because all of the research shows that, uh, you know, we need we need to create more skilled workers for the, you know, for the modern economy. There's already a huge skill gap. Uh, and actually, I know that um, the World Economic Forum uh, is projecting that nine out of 10 jobs are going to be a digital job in the future that, uh, you know, Corn Ferry estimates is going to be a global shortage of 85 million skilled workers by 2030. And the UK space sector alone uh, needs another 30,000 skilled workers by 2030 to meet its own growth projection. So, you know, we put, we do, you know, companies and governments, um, educational authorities, they do recognize this problem and they are trying to reach out uh, but unfortunately, my feeling is that it's always a little too little too late. And, you know, all the studies show that um, children under the age of 12, you know, from the age of at least four, are, are considering all their possible futures with great creativity and imagination. They don't necessarily see impediments and barriers, you know. And even if some of those futures are impossible futures, they're still creating a long list of things that they would be interested in. And then at school, you know, we teach them, teachers are expected to teach them about doctors and farmers and, you know, what does a fireman do? But they never teach them about a software programmer or a meteorologist, you know, and if you talk about jobs in space, you talk about astronauts. And I know from my work through my charity, Primary Space, you know, there've only been a couple hundred astronauts, less than 600 in the history of the world ever. Mm -hmm. And so far, only 12 people to walk on the moon. It's a great, exciting rock star type, you know, role. But most children would say they're not interested in being astronauts because it's too risky. But what they don't know is about the thousands of people behind every space mission who do really interesting work. So I think, you know, what we need to do, in particular, if we want to increase diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. is we need to teach our kids about the hidden figures behind the missions who are doing really interesting work. But let me ask an, an, an open question here. Do you think that our education system, and it's regardless of here in Germany, if it's in Switzerland or in the UK or in US, is capable and able to address these our 21st century problems adequate? Because you mentioned before we, 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 we measure at the moment our, our, our space asset based on our technology from the 70s and 80s or from, from the last century, so mainly. And also the, the rule sets are based on that. But isn't it the same for the education system that we are lacking there so far behind? I mean, you mentioned a, a teacher does not tell what a software developer does, but software developers are very interested interesting for for young kids because you can make a lot of money yes. with, with that so i mean that drives it yeah. but is school st still adequate to address this i mean i
I think it takes a partnership. You know, one mm -hmm. of the key things that I would say is that actually it's it's the companies and the research institutions who have this skills gap problem. And so they need to, you know, reach out to the community and participate in STEM engagement. And I would actually say, you know, I, I believe in STEAM engagement. Um, because, you know, it's really important that, that kids who are more inclined towards arts and creativity mm -hmm. see that they have skills that are, you know, relevant and useful to high tech industries of tomorrow. So uh, is the education system designed for that? Uh, not in the UK, but I don't think, you know, that you can let that get in your way. I, you know, I really think that um, if employers are interested in building that pipeline, they need to make diversity and inclusion, you know, part of their core values. They need to then reach out and to the communities where they live and work themselves and figure out how they can engage. And that's what, you know, that's what my charity is, is trying to do is to make it easy for employers to engage, mm -hmm. but also to make it easy for teachers. Because if you think about it, um, you know, at primary school, unlike older you know educational institutions targeted at older children at primary school your teacher has to be a polymath you you have to teach everything you know music math pe social relationships literacy you know you name it you're the te you teach everything and you know what i've discovered through working with teachers is that talking about what people do in their jobs it makes it a more human conversation mm -hmm. for them and is actually something that they feel more comfortable with and helps them break down those barriers because they may not be very confident teaching STEM topics themselves. Um, but, you know, they don't know what a policeman does all day. And yet, you know, from preschool up, they will talk about, you know, what those people do for their, for their work. So I think it's, you know, we have to support teachers and we have to raise awareness for children and families. And space is so fun and exciting and inspiring. You know, uh, kids love space. They just need to see a, a, a career path in space for them. And then I hope, you know, some of them will lose interest by the time they hit teenage years. But if it's never on their long list of possible futures, it will never make the cut. It will never end up on their short list. That's right. And I just can second it from, from our grandson that uh, when he draws something, then it's usually an astronaut or a robot or something. I mean, yeah, it has a space relation. I would like to, to come to the, to the last question before we uh, pick one or, or, or the other from, from, from the audience. So and you mentioned inclusion, diversity. When we launched our, the first Space Cafe Scotland or a few weeks back, we had the chance to have Mansi from the New Voices on stage. A young our girl or studying or engineering talking on behalf of the, of the next generation. And it was super impressive to see their fears, their, their concerns, their their but also their ideas, yeah? yeah. And I mean, they are full of this energy that maybe a few of them, uh, a few of us don't have anymore, or we, we lost it on our way. So, but what can the sector, the space, the exciting space sector, as you, as you just mentioned, offer and excite to engage with more women, with more girls yeah. to get them in? You know, the average age, I think of, um, mission control during the Apollo launches was 28. And it was 28 because they needed new people who weren't gonna bring old thinking to the mm -hmm. challenges. And I think that's, you know, that's what industry needs to do. Industry needs to reach out to young people and give them a platform and listen to those voices um, and invite them, you know. For instance, we're in the middle of a, uh, developing our next national space strategy in the UK. I haven't yet seen any public engagement or consultation with young people about the space strategy. You know, it's all happening up here at the top of the trade association with the senior officials, you know, in discussion. I think it should be an open public conversation. You should invite those young people with their new ideas to be heard. You know, I think that both policymakers 
and employers should be looking to those people, those young people who want to join the sector or who are in the sector as an incredible asset and give them a platform to be heard. I pick up one interesting question from Anne, uh, and as we learned before from the York University, if I'm not mistaken, so she asks, do we not need new economic models where space companies must operate framed by generative growth? I'm thinking of how an impact economy or a donut economy applies for space beyond our planet. I think a very interesting question and maybe you have an, an answer to offer or at least some thoughts on that. Yeah, I wish I had an answer to offer. Um, I do, you know, I do agree with Anne though that actually um, an impact economy, you know, would, would be worthwhile not just for the space sector, it would be worthwhile for all sectors. Um, no, I don't have an answer, but I think, you know, that donut economy idea where actually things are interconnected and, you know, we should understand the economic impacts upstream and downstream, you know, I think that's um, a really interesting and useful economic um, theory. Unfortunately, um, I am not much of a of a subject matter specialist on on that either. But I do think it's something that you know researchers should continue to uh, to develop. Great. I'm afraid we have to come to an end as we got the warning signals from the production team already. Even so, I I would really like to continue this this inspiring dialogue with, with you. But be assured that we will continue following the next generation topics in our future Space Cafes web talks worldwide and are in our magazine. So this week um, holds up another full event for, for, the, for you, especially in the UK on Thursday at the same time. So 3 p.m. are BST, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European summer time. Um, we will start the first Space Cafe United Kingdom with the wonderful Ian Jones of the Hilly Earth Station. Next week, I will have the pleasure uh, direct after the Pentecost holidays to talk uh, with Will Marshall, the CEO and co-founder of Planet, about the European Green Deal and what satellites, what Planet can offer to support them. A day later, or a few, uh, two days later on the 27th, we have the third edition of the Space Law Breakfast in the morning with Jen, uh, run by uh, Stephen Freeland with the wonderful Jenny Tapio and Alexander Suchek of Ether. And on the same day or in the evening, we have the next edition of the Space Cafe Balkan, in English this time with the CEO of Endosat. And a day later, we start our series of uh, the Space Cafe in Spain, in Spanish. So uh, then you can see 1st of June, I will talk with Professor Thomas Schildknecht about about um, the observation of the universe and how that's possible through all this junk. And then on the 3rd of June, we have the next edition of the Space Cafe Australia by Annie Huntmer. All events are going to be or are online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today because it's pretty cool to have these masks. So your support will help us. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. And I know, but we need your support to keep on doing our work. Thank you all very much for your interest today. And thank you very much, Catherine, for your inspiring talk and being my guest. Thank, thank you, Tristan. Thank you to the entire team for doing their great job week by week again. I hope you all would stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. I hope to see you next week or actually in two days for our next uh, UK edition. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. <laughs>